start uh, the recording. So hi everyone who is joining now, uh, us uh, uh, now uh, online and who is watching that uh, on, on this video. Uh, this recorded video. My name is Alexandra Lecour. I'm the director of European Cultural Academy. Uh, I have my uh, colleagues with me uh, today, Matteo Magnani and Isperia Iliadu, and um, I'm very happy to welcome uh, everyone, all the participants, um, for this session. It is dedicated to our program about Venice Biennale Revealed that takes place in um, uh, November this kind of the end uh, of the uh, of the Biennale, uh, which opened um, at square. the end of Except for May. April um, this year and lasts for six uh, months. And, um, you know, this session is going to be uh, structured in, uh, in the following way. I will give. Uh, I will show you some slide guys uh, about the Biennale, giving some more information about the event itself and about the course in Venice, and then um, uh, I will ask some questions to Esperia, who was the curator of the multinational pavilion for the 2019 um, editions of the previous uh, Art Biennale. Um, and then um, if we have time, uh, you uh, uh, can ask your questions. Uh, while my presentation, if you guys have some questions, please feel free to uh, write them in chat and then we'll have a look at them uh, later. Does that work for everyone? Okay, great. All right, let me share the screen uh, then. Let me see how do I do that in the correct way. Sorry, I'm so. Uh, I'm not very good at um, <laughs> uh, here. Here we go. <clears throat> oh, right. You see that? Okay. All right. So um, in the beginning, I would like to tell you uh, some words about our organization, European Cultural Academy. Uh, we are an educational branch of European Cultural Center in Venice, and the center is the um, second largest cultural foundation in Venice after the Venice Biennale. Um, it was established by an artist called René Rittmeier, and um, we have uh, three palaces in, uh, in Venice and two public sculpture gardens uh, right next to at the Biennale entrance. Um, and in these palaces and gardens, we organize exhibitions during Art and Architecture Biennale. And uh, we also do a lot of events, including Venice Performance Art Week, uh, symposia, conferences, workshops, um, and educational activities. And the Academy is responsible for the educational activities at ECC, European Cultural Center. Um, we mostly do courses for professionals, artists, curators, gallerists who would like to um, make a you know, next step in their art artistic career or who would like to learn more about Venice, its creative scene and the Venice Biennale and the ways to get involved um, in, uh, in the exhibition because it's not that transparent. It's a very old uh, um, Italian um, foundation. So sometimes it's a little bit difficult to understand how can one can participate or become a part of a national pavilion or the central exhibition. I see Esperia is not, uh, nodding. I think even for participants, it could be sometimes a little bit complicated to understand how that works. So um, we thought that it's a, it's a useful, it would be useful to share our experience in Venice in organizing this art project for the Biennale and during um, the Biennale. Um, the Academy, we're not um, that small anymore. Um, this year we have uh, around 400 uh, students that attend courses throughout all uh, year. And uh, in 2022, we run 35 programs. Uh, we have uh, uh, opened a new branch in Amsterdam this year, and this year we have three programs in Amsterdam. Um, we're very lucky to have um, palaces as locations for our courses. So on the photo, you could see at the top Palazzo Bembo, which we will visit during both uh, courses. 
and it's right next to Rialto Bridge. And uh, at the bottom, that's our main headquarters, uh, Palazzo Miguel on Strada Nova. It's a typical Gothic uh, palace, um, and it's located right on the Grand uh, Canal, which um, which is a nice, you know, which is a very nice uh, location for uh, Venice. And um, we're not a university, traditional university, because we do uh, believe in experiential learning. So uh, learning through projects, case studies, um, talking to, to, to people who are actually creating uh, projects, curators, artists who are participating in the Biennale and uh, you know, parallel events to learn from them and be able to make those connections and ask, uh, ask questions. Uh, from people who are involved in, in the event. And of course, uh, during the, um, the programs, we talk uh, about La Biennale di Venezia. And uh, for a lot of people, it is actually a surprise that Biennale is not just a Biennale. There is an event, the show, which is very, very uh, famous, but actually the La Biennale di Venezia, it's a foundation and it includes Biennale d'Arte, Art Biennale, Architecture Biennale, Cinema. So the famous Venice Film Festival is also part of the Biennale. It takes, uh, it takes place every year. So it's actually not a biennial in that sense. Um, and there's also a Biennale of Dance, uh, which actually is, has been taking place the last two weeks in Venice. It's really amazing. It's a short event. It lasts only for a couple of weeks. Music Biennale, Theater Biennale, and of course the Foundation Manager's Historical Archives that include um, all the projects um, that were presented during the uh, exhibition since its beginning. So it's a very big um, organization that actually runs very different events, but always taking place um, in Venice. And we discuss uh, all that and the, those relations, relations. And another thing that um, is a surprise for a lot of uh, participants that Biennale is actually a competition. So there is always a winner. The winner gets a golden lion. Um, for, um, there are two golden lions, one for country, so US this year, it's the Great Britain who got the golden lion. And then there is also best participant. So it's an individual award to an artist who is participating in the central uh, exhibition. And then the silver line goes to a promising young uh, participant and their special uh, mentions um, um, uh, um, for uh, artists. So it is also a competition. So if you are part of the Binali, there would be jury uh, during the pre coming to your location during the preview days, assessing the project and seeing whether you are eligible for an award. Um, this year Biennale is called the Milk of Dreams, a latte dei sogni, very beautiful, uh, um, a magical name. And I must say that this edition is, is really very, very special. Um, it presents uh, more than 200 artists from 58 uh, countries. Uh, which is quite uh, a lot. Some of the artists are, uh, have already passed away, some of them are live, and it has the biggest uh, number of female uh, participants um, in the history of the Biennale. So, yes, yes for that. And um, um, this year there are some countries that are participating for the first time including Cameroon, Namibia, Nepal, Oman, and Uganda. Um, uh, and uh, three new national pavilions from the countries that you see uh, on the slide. This is all, always very exciting to, to see uh, the, you know, the, the art from, 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 this, uh, from new parts uh, of the world. So during Venice Biennale Reveal, we spent one whole day, whole day at Arsenale, where we talked to the Biennale team um, uh, their beautiful lectorium, and then we spend the whole day at Giardini, which in Italian means gardens, and there we will see the central exhibition and uh, also the selected national pavilions. Um, in Giardini, we have the US, Canada pavilion, uh, France, Germany, Great Britain, um, Hungary, um, Japan, and so on. 
um, it's um, it's really very big, beautiful. Uh, uh, it's a very big, beautiful garden. So we'll have um, a guided visit, and then uh, uh, participants will have time to explore uh, the exhibition um, themselves. And um, there is always, always a boss at the exhibition. <laughs> And um, this year, the boss is uh, Cecilia Alemani, and she is an Italian curator. Um, uh, sometimes uh, they call her a creative director of the exhibition. Uh, before becoming a curator for the Biennale, for this edition of the Biennale, um, she uh, was working as a curator of Highline in New York. Uh, managing um, their, art their, their artistic projects at, uh, at the High Line. And on this slide, she's, uh, standing, she's standing next to um, Roberto Cicuto, and he is the president of the Biennale Foundation, um, actually rather new president. And before that, he used to be the director of the film, uh, Venice Film uh, Festival. So um, this is always a very uh, special moment when um, there is an announcement who will become the next curator of the art or architecture Biennale. And of course, <clears throat> during the, the course, we discuss the structure uh, of the exhibition because there is a central, uh, central exhibition and the participants are selected and invited by the curator, in that case, Cecilia Alemani and her team. Um, there are also national pavilions. So there is a national representation by um, US, uh, Israel, uh, Serbia, Italy, and Saudi Arabia and uh, other countries. And the curator doesn't actually have much say in what is presented at, uh, at those uh, pavilions. And then there are collateral events, which are kind of parallel events that are taking place um, uh, during the Biennale, the part, official part of the exhibition. And then there are many, many, many events that are taking place just during those six months in uh, uh, Venetian museums. And um, um, we try to include all of those events in the program during contemporary art, but also, of course, during the Venice Biennale Revealed. I have a slide on the schedule, so you will see that we're able to, to we, we try to see, um, you know, the selected projects from central exhibition, national pavilions, and collateral and satellite events that are in the uh, city center. By the way, Venice Biennale is the only Biennale that, uh, uh, that has this kind of national representations. This is why it is sometimes called the, uh, Olymp the Art Olympics, <laughs> the Olympic Games uh, of uh, uh, art. Um, this year, satellite events include um, amazing, amazing exhibition by uh, Anish Kapoor. Um, uh, and uh, an exhibition by uh, Anselm Kiefer in the Deutsche Palace, right at uh, San Marco Square. There's a really very special event. Anselm Kiefer is um, very interesting because maybe you know that last year Venice turned um, 1600, so it was a big university, uh, anniversary, sorry, anniversary. And uh, the Kiefer's exhibition is also um, uh, dedicated to that anniversary. So it's very site specific. It's, um, it's um, about um, Venice and it was also postponed um, due to uh, COVID. And now we can enjoy it in 2022. And so we talk about those beautiful things. We visit a lot of museums and art, but of course, as in any big event, um, uh, there is also a bit of an ugly side, and we're very open in discussing these kind of things. So we talk about funding, uh, who is paying for the national pavilions and the and, and the main exhibition, um, how it is managed, and we also talk about sustainability issues. Here on the photo, um, you see the central pavilion that was curated by uh, architect Alejandro Aravena. And he actually collected all the materials that have been used for the previous Biennale. 
and uh, made a beautiful installation um, at the central pavilion. So you could see how much garbage actually, um, how much extra material the exhibition produces. And unfortunately, it's still not all of it um, uh, is uh, being recycled and um, uh, it's not done by the Venice Biennale. So we also talked to uh, a foundation, uh, an NGO, which is called Re Biennale. You see the logo on the slide. And this is an NGO enthusiast who are working directly with national pavilions, uh, collecting plywood, um, uh, metal, and other materials used uh, in the pavilions, in the projects. And then they would offer them to the newcomers who participate the next year. So, I mean, in Binal, there, there also could be some ironic things, um, like there would be a beautiful project on climate change and sustainability. Um, and, you know, the materials would uh, fly from Japan or Canada for six months to the Biennale. There would be a whole team flying to Venice talking about these very important issues, but then nobody actually thinks uh, uh, what will happen with the exhibition afterwards, what is the carbon footprint uh, of that project um, in general. So we also discuss these kind of things and invite students to, um, to see Biennale from uh, different points um, of uh, view, which is of course very, very, always very interesting and relevant. <clears throat> and this is, Actually, my last slide, because I don't want to be talking for a for long time uh, uh, today. This is the schedule uh, for the our program in uh, November. And you, I mean, this is now said there might be some minor changes, but in general, this is the program that um, you can expect. So we always start with uh, Palazzo, in Palazzo Miguel on Grand Canal with an introduction. And we have a lecture from a professor, Laura, from Professor Laura Tinti. We call it from Bellini to Biennale, but this is basically the curatorial history uh, of the exhibition uh, from the 18th century to 2022. And then of course we see um, Venice. Uh, we go to see selected national pavilions and collateral events uh, that are in, um, in the city center. And um, we always go to Fonda Codé Tedeschi, which offers the best panoramic view in uh, Venice, um, a beautiful project by Dutch uh, studio OMA and Rem Kolhas, who actually used to be the curator of the architecture Biennale a couple of years ago. The next day is dedicated to um, organization and structure of the Biennale, so how to participate in, in Venice Biennale if you're an artist or curator, um, what is possible, um, how difficult it is, what is the timeline, funding, uh, and things like that. And then we, of course, will talk to Esperias, and she could share her experience from participating in the previous edition. And then the afternoon is dedicated to Giardini della Biennale, one of the main locations of the uh, uh, of this of, 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 of the exhibition. On Saturday, we visit Arsenale. It's a, a big, um, um, what is the English uh, word? Uh, uh, shipyard, shipyard, a huge, huge uh, a structure filled with art, um, overwhelming, but also um, amazing. And then there we meet the Biennale team. Uh, we have a guided um, uh, uh, visit to, 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 to Arsenale, and then students have time to, um, uh, to enjoy the exhibition um, themselves. And then on Sunday, um, I don't know if how many of you know who Peggy Guggenheim was, but this lady is a, has a very special place in Venetian uh, art uh, scene. So she uh, was a, a niece of uh, Solomon Guggenheim with the uh, Guggenheim collection in uh, New York, of course. And we go to Palazzo uh, de Leoni, which was uh, her house. And uh, now it hosts um, one of the best collections of modern uh, art um, in Venice and maybe in Europe. And um, the 
um, museum is um, quite small and we have very good relationship with them. So we go there at nine before the museum is open to public. So we'll have a private tour at Peggy Guggenheim collection, which is at her house, which is quite um, special. And by the way, we're doing the same um, with the contemporary art uh, course. So for an hour, it's only going to be us uh, enjoying the, the museum. Um, and then my favorite part uh, of the course, the discussion, the group discussion, to be in Ale or not to be in Ale. And here we want to he hear from the participants what they think um, of, the, of, the, of, of, of the event and see whether they find it sustainable, whether they find it relevant, whether they find that it's just not, uh, still the best format to present uh, contemporary art from all over the world, or whether we should do something else, national versus international, artistic versus commercial, uh, political versus individual art. So all those issues that um, you know, will be coming up uh, during uh, our courses, during, during our course, during our visit, this, this is the time where we discuss it in group and we're always very curious to hear what the students uh, say. And then, of course, we're in Venice, so there's going to be a certificate ceremony with Prosecco, uh, with Italian Prosecco, and uh, a boat tour um, around Venice. And this is a, always a part of all our courses, also contemporary art, certificate ceremony with Prosecco uh, to... <laughs> So this year, at the beginning of the season, uh, Julia, our program manager, uh, she bought 170 bottles of Prosecco for all the students. <laughs> so we always enjoy that uh, part with the students. And then there is a boat tour and seeing the city from water um, gives you a completely different um, perspective. So it is um, also very nice to see San Marco, to see uh, Peggy Guggenheim, um, Academia uh, from, uh, for, from, uh, from the canal uh, during the boat tour. It's a, a very nice uh, uh, wooden uh, taxi boat that um, we arrange for, for the students. So this, I hope, uh, gives you a, um, a peek into the, um, into the course. Um, and um, now, oh, I, let me see if we have some uh, questions. Oh, I seem to get cut off in instances. I hope it works later. Oh, oh, it's oh, it's you, Speria. I think now I see you very well. Uh, I can ask you to unmute. Hi. 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 Yes. Hi. You're joining. Hi. I'm so happy you're joining us. Thank you. Um. So. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Yes. So Esperia gives the most fantastic uh, uh, lectures of Q&As um, <laughs> ab uh, about um, curatorial matters and creating art projects also specifically in Venice. And um, today I just wanted to, to have this very open, uh, open, you know, flexible uh, conversation. And I wanted to ask about your your experience on working with Biennale in um, 2019 for the multinational pavilion. Okay. So um, actually my, my first question is, how did you get involved? How did you become the curator? Okay. So um, it's, it's always uh, a, a strange, let's say path, but always very rewarding. And um, how do, did I get involved? Let's see. Uh, I have I have created the inaugural exhibition for the European Capital of Culture. That was in 2017. And uh, it was in my country. I come from Greece. And the next Capital of Culture in Europe was, uh, was held in Malta. So actually through this process, I met, uh, I met a lot of Maltese artists and uh, when the open call for Malta came along, I had, uh, I had them, some of them contacted me and asked me if I could uh, work along with them to present a proposal uh, and participate, let's say, in this open call, this competition, because um, as 
when it comes to national pavilions, they are public projects. So usually they're not led by a private gallery. Sometimes a private gallery will collaborate uh, with an official entity of a country, but as such, they are considered representatives of a nation. So it's kind of a public process. So as a public process in all the countries of the world, usually you get an open call because it's considered to be public money invested in art. So they need to do this competition. Um, so that was that, like uh, I got together with them and as curators usually do, like uh, thought of uh, a story to tell and what would be interested to present. And, uh, but I, I want to, if it's, if it's okay, Alexandra, I want also to, to involve, could we involve also our audience, let's say? Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. Yes, so of I, course. Let's say uh, this, this moment, you're invited to create a national pavilion. Where do you think you would draw your inspiration? So, so that is like the big question. It, the answer is personal every time. But I think uh, whatever we do, our choices are really relevant to what is happening around us at a certain moment. So that is what I did. At that certain moment, the Mediterranean was a very, let's say, um, interesting locality, I might say, not only Malta, but it was a time when we had a lot of refugees displacement, people moving across the water. So from that, um, let's say that thing that was happening and was concerning the community, the local community in Malta, but also like the biggest audience, greater audiences internationally, and also myself, because I work in social engagement, whether it is within museums or within exhibitions that I create, Social engagement and socially related subjects are always a big concern for me. And I think it's a big opportunity to present such topics at the Biennale. So from that came the inspiration. Uh, then in a sense, you put down a story as you would, uh, even when writing a book and you work with your artists, you select works of art, in our case, their works of art were commissioned, were to be commissioned, especially uh, created for the Venice Biennale, if we were to be chosen. Then you put all that together, obviously with a financial plan, an evaluation, a primary evaluation of how the project would involve when it comes to funds. Then you submit everything to it was, usually it's a ministry of culture that is involved. You do that and then you just wait. And if you're called, there's a process of interviewing, pitching for your uh, proposal. And finally, if you get it, then even more, the journey afterwards is even more difficult. And I think a curator's position is like the most challenging one in projects such as this, because you are the person that will balance and is in the middle actually between the artist creativity and what administrators from the governmental body that sponsors the exhibition expect from you. So you are in a very difficult position and it's not such an easy task. So no, I can. I, I really yes, I, I I can't believe you that it's not <laughs> not an easy task to to create something like that. And um, I also think it's um, it's worth mentioning that Venice is a very special city mm -hmm. for art projects in terms of logistics. For example, there are no cars, eh? there are no roads yes. in Venice, so everything needs to be. You know, it flies into Mesk, yeah. into 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 the airport, and then it's being brought yeah. by boat. Or if it's a very heavy project, uh, piece of art by crane, yeah. and a lot of people do not, they 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 tend to to forget it. From yeah. um from uh, I also I also have a theory that it's um this is why Venice has become such a 
popular city because yeah. it doesn't matter whether you arrive in a, in a super yacht and you stay in a five-star hotel or your student staying in a hostel, yeah. you know, you, you have to walk. And, um, and then all those galleries, I talked to director of Bel Air uh, uh, Gallery and mm -hmm. they have uh, locations all over the world in Venice, for example, and New York. And she says, mm -hmm. we have, in terms of sale in Venice, we have 70% of walk-ins a sale and in New York it's always by appointment and we arrange a parking for them so people are coming in <laughs> with a chauffeur and she said yes because you have to walk in Venice so there is this mix of uh, you know art collectors art students curators all walking the same very narrow streets and I think that that creates that special special atmosphere and we yeah. feel it during the preview days but also throughout the Biennale right yes Definitely. And um, I don't know yet, like whether the participants, like your artists or creators or people interested in art, for sure. I think if you go through this experience, if somebody, in a sense, learns how to create an exhibition in Venice, then you can actually do it anywhere. Because as Alexandra also mentioned previously, I think it's the most demanding uh, city to set up an exhibition whether you would go through the process of teaching for a national participation, or obviously you would give it a try as an independent curator or independent mm -hmm. artist. Also that is very beautiful in Venice. Uh, let's say I have, I also teach in Florence in a different program, but I want to say that Venice is so different from any other city, even in Italy, even a city like Florence doesn't really give you these opportunities. Uh, it's not an open city to artists and art lovers, but more introverts. Instead, Venice is totally the place to be, uh, to investigate. And if you really have this uh, ambition, dream or interest to curate or to present your work here, it is possible. possible. It's difficult. It might be, yeah. but with the, uh, with the adequate knowledge or help uh, from counselors or uh, consultants and so on, it's an easy that you can give you this window to the world. And it's very interesting to yeah. be here. Definitely. And there, and there, I mean, you see that there are hundreds of projects happening throughout those yeah. six months yeah. so there is a lot of people coming from abroad that having a short-term project a performance uh, a show which lasts six yeah. months uh, two weeks and so on there are a lot of different type of projects um, that yeah. are happening in the city Esperia, what was the most surprising thing when working with the Biennale okay let's see uh, okay I'm I, I curated for the Biennale, but also for some years I worked as commissioner for national pavilions. A commissioner is actually the person who uh, manages the project, so does the logistics and so on. What is the most demand? Uh, so I worked both for the uh, setting up an exhibition within the Arsenal space, as was the Marta National Pavilion. I worked with Greece last year. Greece is in the Giardini. And, but I have also worked with countries with collateral events that exhibit in the city. So I think in that case, uh, the most uh, demanding thing is actually following up with the bureaucracy that the city has, or it is imposed by the Biennale itself. So yeah. there are many deadlines and many let's say, uh, guidelines yeah, that you need to follow and you need to do it. And it's parallel, obviously, from the creative process of a creator or an artist uh, working and being uh, in Venice. Then uh, when it comes to national pavilions, I touched a little bit upon that before, is that the country that commissions you to represent them really takes it obviously and it's natural very seriously so you are in this very delicate position and you are presenting to the world so you're also very exposed in a sense 
one from one part is very beautiful. Your work uh, will be seen by the world, but at the same time, you are dealing with local press, with critique, uh, with many different uh, mm -hmm. kinds of uh, even attacks at some time. You might get like uh, emails or negative press that concerns politics or decisions you make. So everything is scrutinized and it goes and goes beyond what you as uh, a creative are doing because a lot of politics also are involved in the process and you're there expo exposed, pre presenting a country to the world. And that I must say, like being, I see, I see some of the faces, but I see some beautiful ladies here with us. Like uh, it, this year's Biennale gave that very strong, let's say, position and put forward uh, female uh, faces uh, in, of the art world, growth from history and current contemporary creatives. But for a woman working uh, in the field, it's always more difficult, I think, uh, to be ac uh, accepted and to be, let's say, uh, validated for the hard work. Yeah. So it's never an easy job. No, yeah. no, but it's so so worth it, uh, right? Worth. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Um, uh, do you uh, guys have um, questions for Esperia or for me? No. Okay. I, uh, um, I actually have one question uh, for you. I yes, talked to, to Marta Godinho, who, who, who was the main artist representing Luxembourg Pavilion and Arsenal okay. in 2019. And okay. usually what happens is that, and it's also very interesting how the dynamic has changed throughout mm -hmm. the years. Before, Binali was kind of the pinnacle of your career, right? So yeah. You, cannot, uh, you are there. Yeah. Now we see more and more young artists participating in the Biennale. Mm -hmm. There are different, I think it's wonderful. There are different reasons for this. One reason being that there are some galleries involved in, um, in the Biennale. So if they have a young artist, they like to have them in the Biennale because they know that after the exhibition, the price will uh, yeah. double and triple. So you know, sometimes there might be some commercial uh, interest driving the participation of young artists. But any case, it's like I talked to Marco and he said, it, I said, what was the impact of participating in the Biennale on your career? And um, it was 2019. And he said, look, um, I got a lot of media attention and a lot of projects, new projects, um, when people got to know that I was um, uh, in Arsenale, but then COVID hit mm -hmm. and everything that was, he had to ride this wave, right? And yeah. afterwards he said, all the projects got canceled or postponed and then, then yeah. it was not the same. So did you experience that it was like, you were supposed to, to have more project and then because of COVID it kind of slowed down. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that that is uh, that is correct, definitely. And uh, unfortunately, we are uh, the unlucky ones. Let's say that we were totally in that uh, let's say boundary before and after uh, the COVID era. Let's say so. Even let's say Malta was uh, considered by different uh, journals online by Freeze and so on as one of the five uh, worth seeing pavilions that year. Yeah. So also we were very lucky to get uh, a lot of publicity and also praised especially for this uh, social message and that we dealt with uh, issues that were very concerned with the current political and social situation in the Mediterranean Sea. Also, I want to say that is something that we saw in the following years. It's also, this is also a debate whether national pavilions should exist because as all the boundaries seem to be loosened, seem to be more elusive now in all things, there is this great debate and I'm publishing an article in the Biennial Foundation Journal uh, this year and it all refers to the question whether national pavilions should exist. And what I did, I wanted to present the Malta Pavilion as a pavilion of the Mediterranean Sea. 
So actually not representing a nation, but uh, trying to touch upon the different realities, but also draw artists and different creatives that made out the team that realized the pavilion at the end from the whole of the Mediterranean uh, region. But yes, uh, unfortunately, afterwards, uh, we had like many, many, many projects uh, here in Venice and in the world. Uh, but unfortunately, there was this, uh, mm -hmm. this break, let's say. Um, yes, but hopefully that we can build up still. Yeah, uh, get back exactly. And, build up yeah. On that. and maybe worth, worth, mentioning, worth mentioning what happened actually with the Biennale. So yeah. Usually, even years are architecture, uneven art, and it has been like this for, for years. So now that we'll in even year we have art, it changed the whole calendar of the yeah. art world and uh, documenta and so manifest it all kind of changed the uh, uh, changed the travel calendar for most of the galleries, I think. Um, but what happened is that in 20, uh, 20 it was cancelled. And then in, it was postponed, the, the architecture Binali was first canceled, then they said we're going to run it instead of six months for three months, so the opening going to be in August instead of uh, April, then in August they say we're not going to uh, do the architecture Biennale, so they postponed it until 2021, it finally was opened and then the art Biennale was moved one year. Uh, let's say further, further. Um, and um, that's one thing. And the second thing that I wanted to also comment on that um, with the national pavilions, indeed there are international teams working on the national project. So you don't yeah. need to be uh, the, the citizen of the country you're working for. So there are many examples of curators coming from completely different part of the world than the pavilion they're working on. And usually artists, it could be a collective or artists could, you know, it could be a Chinese artist living in France who got educated in, uh, in the UK. So whether he really represents Chinese art now, it's a big question. And the question is, you know, we, we cannot expect Ai Weiwei, for example, to be in the China, China National Pavilion anytime soon. Uh, so, you know, what kind of artists uh, are in there and what kind of projects they're representing. It's also a very interesting um, food for thought, um, I think, yes. right? Yes. And uh, Alexandra mentioned before, like a lot of young artists being uh, promoted uh, in this uh, in this editions, but it's also good to see that this edition of the Biennale uh, had uh, like almost half of the artists presented are not with us anymore. Yeah. So like uh, Alemani's uh, proposal has also this very educative, uh, let's say, character. And I, I researched the history of exhibitions and I also teach in that field. And I think this is an exhibition that nobody should miss. And I think from now on, I, it will be an exhibition that I will include, let's say, in my research as a turning point. And I wanted to, like in the merit of it, uh, mention like phrase from the catalog, which I think will be interesting. Uh, uh, it says in the catalog that it, it's a, it aims to re-educate through re-enchantment so uh, it's uh, this idea of like relearning uh, different histories different realities different imaginations uh, and it's a wonderful absolutely wonderful uh, edition of a Biennale that I think um, when you participate in this uh, course uh, this session you will be very amazed from its beauty and totally captivated. Yeah. I also like this. Uh, by, for yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, really uh, I think it's a unique example also because of this attention to feminist histories, like alternative histories, and yeah. it has a certain, uh, let's say, delicate, delicate sensitivity in the way things are presented. 
and myself as also because I actually I saw I saw a question uh, in the chat by David David and oh yes touch upon it like um, in all the classes I teach I always say like uh, the person that has the most interesting contribution is the person that is outside of the forest, let's say, because mm -hmm. all the people that work within the field, we are people kind of lost in a forest looking for our way. But somebody that comes outside from the discipline, I think, has a more clear view and actually could be a, a very uh, a, a contribution that actually defines uh, our practice because as a creator also um, I believe that, that we should create listening uh, to what uh, our audiences and what the people see uh, what they perceive it's not so much an academic uh, process of presenting the best work of art and so on but mostly how you would present a story that's most engaging uh, to, to everybody, not only the people that, let's say, are within uh, the district. Exactly, I agree. So, so the question was, could yeah. you elaborate a bit more about the profile um, of the participants of the program? Is it a good fit for someone with no professional um, art experience? Or, the, the, uh, or uh, I can prepare myself to get the most from the program um so you're willing to start the business in this method so uh, you know i i i say also i follow on, on asperia's uh, comment absolutely so we always have um, um a very diverse group of participants i think half of them are professionals so artists curators uh, gallerists art consultants we also have some students not not a lot but some art students usually doing their masters already in museum studies history of art fine arts and uh, subjects like that but we also have art lovers and art collectors who are joining us and for them it is an opportunity to to learn uh, about the Biennale have interesting conversations about what is going on in the contemporary art world and um, and you know the course is structured in a way that uh, all levels could benefit so it's um, it's not a problem if you um, if you don't have um, a professional uh, art uh, experience. It is the program is open to everyone, and it's interesting to see what kind of projects you're going to do, uh, because we have uh, participants who you know also coming from different disciplines. Actually, in the art course um, that starts in a couple of weeks, we're going to have Steven Weinberg, who is alumni, so he did the course contemporary art course with us in two thousand twenty. He is a CFO of a very big investment fund, and he he wanted to be an artist all his life. So he decided to do. He's now an NFT artist. So he created already three NFT projects, and with the academy, it was his first project. So we helped him with conceptual statement, um, production, and uh, and things like that. And then he just uh, you know can do uh, can do projects independently. So. Uh, we'll hear from from Stephen and his journey as well, and he really didn't have any any background um, in the area. So that's that's all uh, possible. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's all um, possible. So uh, Stephen will be in contemporary art program. Uh, I don't know, David, if you're joining us for contemporary art or you're thinking about uh, the November uh, course. Um, but I can. Uh, um, maybe later Matteo can share his Steven Instagram uh, profile so you could uh, you could see his uh, works um, as well and um, yeah so he's now an, a digital artist uh, doing uh, all kind of um, NFTs super interesting maybe he knows even more oh he knows more about okay I remember one. he knows more about um, NFT uh, <laughs> world than I do <laughs> Yes, yes, uh, I will. Uh, let me let me even share it in the chat. Uh, just a second, I'm gonna find him. Uh, I'm gonna find him uh, here. So that's um, so we get uh, we get non-professional. It's CV. So it's the city that inspires, and obviously, exactly. you know, like. Um, 
through the team, you will find a lot of guidance and for sure, uh, very interesting people that you can ask and uh, oh, no, some sorry. guidance. Uh, so. Oh, he doesn't make it easy. So it's TV art, it's TV art. Uh, that's the correct uh, Instagram profile. So, um, so find him. Um, yes. Um, uh, does anyone else have a question for me or um, Esperia or Matteo? Yeah. All right. Mm, oh. No, I, I was going to say this is just logistical, but I can email just about, you know, arriving and getting there and, and all that. So, um, yeah. I think Matteo will be, will be happy. Yeah, to Nancy, help. you can. Yeah, we, we have each other contacts, Nancy. You can uh, email us. Uh, probably you also have our, uh, my WhatsApp uh, contact. So, uh, as you, as, as it's, uh, as it works better for you. Okay, thanks. And um, Hesperia, so what are you working on now? So you're teaching yeah. and what projects are you working on now? All right. Um, mostly, mostly I am a museums person. So I enjoy doing exhibitions in museums as well. I find working with historical collections very interesting and trying to give them this contemporary, let's say, interpretation. So I am working on a, an exhibition of Byzantine manuscripts. That, yes, that will be held in uh, San Marco Square at San Marc's library, uh, the Marciana Library in the end of August. So there is this, uh, there's the International Byzantine Scholars <laughs> Conference. So we're trying to, I'm, I'm doing that exhibition within uh, the San Sovino room, which is like an absolutely beautiful Renaissance architecture room trying to present, uh, let's say, manuscripts in a contemporary way, let's say for contemporary audiences. So that is uh, the, the most like something that comes up now. But then for next year, we're preparing also for the architecture Biennale right now. So uh, a lot of things and, and I teach, as I said, yes. So I'm... Um, also, I guess it would be also useful maybe for Alexandra and Matteo if you have any expectations or like uh, thoughts to share, I guess. Like. I think I, I, I think um, for me, I'm always looking forward to to actually welcoming the students um, in Venice. Uh, we have uh, international groups. The contemporary art group is uh, heavily in North America, thanks to Daniel Crisa, I guess. <laughs> Um, but we have uh, we have also some European uh, uh, participants uh, uh, coming, and then uh, Venice Biennale revealed the groups. You know, usually we have around eleven nationalities um, per group, and it's always a very nice dynamic. We uh, share the profiles, just the general profiles of the students, with um, with the lecturers in advance. So we also try to um, adapt the program to to the profiles, also for the visits. You know, if we we know from which countries the participants are coming from, we try to cover the national pavilions from the respective countries and so on. So we slightly adjust um, every edition to the needs um, of the students. Okay. I've shared uh, 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 Steven's uh, Instagram account on the chat. It's stevie.art. Um, and, um, and I think his project also in the highlights of the European Cultural Academy, ECA.Venice um, Instagram. If you are not following us, please do. Venice, Venice. The us. All right. Then, um, um, I would like to, to thank um, uh, all of you and Esperia, thank you very much for joining us uh, on that Saturday. Um, for some people morning, I guess, or um, afternoon. Um, thank you very much for watching this video if you're uh, looking at it at the recording. 
and we you know we if you still have questions or when if you get questions please uh, feel free to contact Matteo at uh, Matteo uh, at European Cultural Academy or study at European Culture Academy he also shared his um, details in the chat and um, uh, I hope to 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 see you in uh, Italy very very soon thank you thank you so thank much you everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.